Now, Vivado HLS basically stands for high level synthesis, right? And what happens when I run this Vivado HLS is that, you know, it brings up some uh, GUI, okay? And the thing is, one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that, you know, you can also run most of the things without the GUI, but the GUI is sort of convenient more than anything else from the point of view of how you can uh, just visualize a lot of things and also, you know, provide some uh, easy way of doing certain uh, things. So I'm going to create a new project. The way that Vivado works is that everything over here is called a project where you add source files and within those source files will be the code that you want to actually, you know, convert to hardware. Okay. Uh, I can basically call this uh, anything. I'll call it uh, demo code or something, something like that. Right. And uh, what I'm going to do over here is I'll, I need to add some files. In this case, the first one that I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this file called demo.cpp. I'll show you in a moment what exactly that is. It also asks me if I want to add a test bench. Okay. Now, in the present code that I'm writing, and in fact, even in the next example that I'll show you, there is no test bench, right? Now, what is a test bench in general? We already saw an example with the Verilog code, right? And in the Verilog code, what was it that you needed to do? You basically were given a test bench, right? And the job of the test bench is to apply certain types of inputs to the device under test, set up all the infrastructure, things like the clock, reset, uh, and uh, monitoring and printing statements, and then just basically run the simulation, okay? Now, Vivado HLS works with C code, C or C++ code, right? Which means that over here, instead of being Verilog, everything is a C-based test bench, right? It just the only difference is that the test bench is based on C and not in Verilog, okay? And Vivado has actually done a very nice thing in the sense that they have made test benches sort of, you know, they have made it such that the importance of the test bench is brought up front uh, right from the beginning, okay? And in fact, the way that they do it is you are strongly encouraged throughout the development process to write a test bench. And in fact, the test bench has, should generally try and follow some conventions. And the convention that they use is that as long as you run the test bench and you know it invokes whatever function it is that you are trying to synthesize and uh, when the test bench finally finishes and exits if it returns a value of zero that is considered a success if it returns any value other than zero that is considered a failure of the test bench okay now why is this nice because they are now able to use exactly the same test bench in order to also test your code after synthesis. In other words, it can use your C based test bench and generate equivalent Verilog code, which will be used in order to test your Verilog, which gets synthesized. Okay, all that will become clear in a later example. I think uh, I'll probably you know run through an example of an FFT code at some point. At that point, uh, this will be a lot more clear and easy to understand. For now, you can ignore the test bench because we don't have a test bench in today's examples. Now, Vivado also works on this, uh, you know, it, uh, concept of solutions, okay? And a solution over here, you can think of it essentially as a Pareto point. Okay, you remember the Pareto design space that we uh, discussed once earlier, right? What happens in the Pareto design space is that you can have multiple different solutions, each one of which will have a different number of clock cycles, a different area, it could also have, you know, a different uh, power consumption. Now, as far as uh, Vivado is concerned, for the most part, the metrics that it will look at will be the number of clock cycles, the latency and the uh, area, the number of lookup tables, flip flops and so on. Okay. The nice thing is it basically allows you to create these multiple solutions and any one of those solutions can then be compared against the others quite easily. It provides a nice GUI way of doing it. That's all. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave it at the default. It's called solution one, right? Uh, we'll in fact not be looking at multiple solutions at least right now. The clock period is 10 and this is in nanoseconds, right? And uh, essentially what is uh, happening over here is that when you, uh, because Vivado HLS is very specifically targeted at Xilinx FPGAs, 
they know the kind of frequencies at which these FPGAs can operate and therefore they can tune their entire software towards that domain. Okay, which is why you will see that many of the defaults actually make a lot of sense as far as FPGAs are concerned. In particular, what they say is you can uh, you can sort of assume that the default frequency at which you want the FPGA system to run is 100 megahertz. That is a 10 nanosecond clock period. Okay. Now, if you were designing an ASIC, you might probably have some totally different clock frequency that you target, right? And even in an FPGA, you might find that 100 megahertz is not really sufficient. You might want to go to 200 or 300 if your FPGA allows it. Or on the other hand, you might also want to run it at a lower frequency, okay? But this is just sort of a sensible default. You can change this number and play around with it. The next important part is this part selection, okay? And over here, what we can do is they have all the different parts within the Xilinx uh, product family, right? You can uh, use uh, choose among different options over here. I'm going to choose something called the Artix 7 family, okay? And in fact, this part number that I have is uh, something called the, you know, uh, don't worry about this part number. You don't need to memorize it. The reason I'm choosing this part number is because it is something which is there on a board that is readily available in my lab. And at some point, if I need to show a hardware demo, I'll be able to use this, okay? You could choose any other uh, element that you want to. It doesn't matter. Now, one thing to note on the right-hand side over here, you will see that, for example, it shows you the number of slices and in particular, the number of lookup tables and flip-flops, okay? And also the number of DSP slices and VRAMs. What are all of these numbers? Just to recall, in an FPGA, how is the logic implemented? FPGAs don't have NAND gates, NOR gates, and so on internally. Okay. Instead, what they have is lookup tables. And what does a lookup table consist of? It's essentially either four inputs or six inputs, right? Uh, in fact, uh, these FPGAs are probably six input lookup tables. Uh, a six input lookup table basically means that it can take six inputs, x1, x2, x3, up to x6, right? And it will have one output. And how does it work? Because after all, you know, if you have six inputs, that basically means like your truth table consists of two power six, that is 64 entries. Effectively, all that you do is you take the truth table of whatever function you want to implement and directly code it into that lookup table. Okay. So as a result, when the inputs are applied to that LUT, it's usually called a LUT, lookup table or LUT. When, a, when the input is applied to that LUT, the output directly becomes whatever is specified by the truth table, okay? So you don't need to worry about whether it's a NAND gate or a NOR gate or, you know, some more complicated gate. It can implement any function of up to six inputs, okay? The next column after that, FF, stands for flip-flops, okay? And you can see that this particular FPGA has around 40,000 flip-flops. It has around 20,000 lookup tables and 40,000 flip-flops. Those of you who have done ASIC design will realize that this looks a bit skewed, right? I mean, normally you would have a lot of combinational logic and not that many flip-flops, okay? Because flip-flops or registers are fairly expensive in an ASIC design. On an FPGA, on the other hand, the way the architecture is built is such that flip-flops are plenty. Okay, so you have a large number of flip-flops. In fact, you will see that the number of flip-flops is twice as many as the number of lookup tables. Okay, now keep in mind, you remember what I said, the lookup table is not something as simple as a NAND gate. It can perform a Boolean function of up to six inputs. So you can't really say that, you know, I have twice as many flip-flops as gates. That's not really correct, right? Each gate, each lookup table over here is a fairly complex beast in itself. Anyway, as far as this particular FPGA is concerned, it has around 40,000 flip-flops, 20,000 lookup tables. It has 90 DSP slices. Now, what is a DSP slice? Uh, by the way, this term slice is something which is commonly used inside Xilinx FPGAs. It essentially refers to one unit out of which the FPGA is built, okay? And pretty much as you can see over there, from the numbers, right? Uh, each slice basically contains four lookup tables and eight flip-flops. Okay. DSP slices are separate. They are not part of the regular FPGA slices. They are called DSP slices on their own. In this particular FPGA, there are 90 uh, DSP slices, each one of which is capable of implementing, uh, I believe, an 18 cross 18 uh, multiplication. 
okay and finally you have vram block rams okay and a block ram essentially indicates that this is a high density high capacity memory high capacity compared to the flip flops right each block ram is capable of storing 18 kilobits of memory 18000 bits 18 into 10 power 4 uh, sorry into 1024 right so 18k kilobits and there are 100 such block rams the number of flip flops is around 40k which is if you look at the number that's roughly equal to two block rams okay so clearly these block rams provide you with a, lo a lot more storage capacity than the flip flops and can be used primarily for you know storing all kinds of intermediate data while doing whatever computation it is that you are trying to do right so the number of block rams i mean the total capacity of the block rams is obviously far more than that of the flip flops but if you look at the actual raw capacity 18 kilobits into 100 so that's only 1.8 megabits of ram right which is roughly around 200 kilobytes or so okay this when you think of it in terms of kilobytes the total memory present inside this fpga is actually pretty tiny 200 kilobytes i mean you know you can't even think of having a processor with an operating system in that kind of memory okay there are of course fpgas with more memory but still this vram is going to be at most up to a few megabytes or so right and really not sufficient for storing large amounts of data